If you're taking calculus this year, one of the things you're going to encounter early on in the course is this oddity of a line, very much like the lines you've seen a million times before in Algebra 1 and Algebra 2 and probably pre-calculus, except this line is going to have one quirky feature, which is that it's gonna have a hole in it. Understanding this hole and how we would describe the line's behavior at and around the hole is key to understanding the core idea that underpins all of the machinery that you're going to learn throughout calculus. So it may very well seem like this line with a leak is a really contrived example. Like, why is my teacher showing me this? It's like, it's just so ridiculous what they do in math. We understood lines, it made perfect sense. And then they went and punched holes in all all of the lines just to confuse us. No, this is the opposite of that. This is to not confuse you, because the whole point of the line with a hole in it is that it makes for the easiest way to give you an introduction to the core idea underneath calculus, and that's the idea of a limit. Now, a limit is exactly what it sounds like. It's a value that is approached, generally speaking. The reason these are so useful in calculus is that oftentimes you'll find yourself making a jump from the finite to the infinite in calculus. And that's rather difficult because infinity is not a number, so it's not like you can just plug it into a function, for example. But the way we deal with this, making the a giant leap, you could say, from finiteness to infiniteness is with the limit. Before we talk about what the limit has to do with this line with a hole in it, although this is a useful example, it's true that it is a bit contrived, and so I'd like to show you a more natural situation, both historically and just in terms of general applications, where the limit shows up. So imagine we have a function, something like this. You could imagine I have a point on this function. Let's say that the x coordinate of this point is c, and then consider some other point past c, maybe over here, that has an x coordinate we'll just call x. Now what if I ask you how fast the function is changing from c to x? We could say, well, it certainly is changing. We see that it mostly seems to go up from C to X. How fast is it changing? Well, you may or may not know how to calculate that. For now, it's not really important, though I will tell you, if we sketch the line that passes through C and X, this is called a secant line. And the slope of that line is the average rate of change of the function from here to here. Now, I could choose X to be anywhere I like, and I could find the slope of this line passing through C and X, and that would tell me the average rate of change of this function over that interval. With one exception, I can't put X directly on C. Again, you might not know how to calculate the average rate of change of a function. It comes down to the slope of a line, though. It's rise over run. Sometimes that's abbreviated like this, delta Y divided by delta X. That's your change in Y divided by your change in X. And if I put this X coordinate directly on C, the change in X is going to be zero. If X is on C, we're not actually moving at all change in x would be zero, and you know we can't divide by zero. So I could put x anywhere I like, I could do the calculation, except at c. I could move x quite close to c, I could bring x over here, hey that's a little bit closer to c, let me zoom in so you can see this. I could bring x over here, that's even closer to c. I could bring x here, I could bring x as close to c as I want, I might even say I could bring x infinitely close to C, I just can't place it directly at C. And this is where our friend the limit comes in. Although I might not be able to do my familiar calculation for the average rate of change of a function if I put x directly on C, what I can do is ask if that value, that rate of change, approaches something in particular if we let x get infinitely close to c, is there some limit there? Is there some value that's approached? 
Now, unlike the line with a hole in it, that's a very useful question to be able to answer. And in answering that question, you would have a way of finding, roughly speaking, the rate of change of a function at an individual point, the rate of change of a function at a moment in time. If the function was modeling the position of some object over time, what you would be finding is its instantaneous velocity. Now, with all that said, you see an interesting way where limits are highly motivated. Let's come back to our contrived example to talk about limits a little bit more specifically. Because here's the thing, the point of the hole in the line is to give you a simple example of seeing how the behavior of a function is not exactly the same as the limits. So if I call this function, let's say we call it f of x, there are some things I could say about f of x, specifically if I put some labels here on the x and y axis. Let's go ahead and do that. Let's say that the x coordinate of the hole occurs at, we'll say x equals two. So that's two, right there is one. And let's say the y coordinate of the hole is maybe that's four. So up there is four, there's two, one, and three. Just based off the sketch, if we ignore the whole for the moment, we could say that this function is just f of x equals x plus two. It's a line with a slope of one with a y-intercept of two. You see it crossing the y-axis there at y equals two, and you can also see its slope of one, right? It goes over one up one and over one up one. And now there are many values of this function I could list. For example, I could write that f of zero is equal to two. If we look at where x equals zero, the value of the function there, the y-coordinate, is two. Similarly, I could consider f of 1. I could write that f of 1 is equal to, well, I can't see it exactly on the graph. I can't be sure because it's a sketch, but assuming this equation is correct, f of 1 would be 3, and that looks about right. f of 1 is 3. But if I then go to f of 2, well, there's an issue, right? The function has a hole there. The function isn't defined at x equals two. Now, at this point in your mathematical journey, that probably seems like some rather peculiar behavior, and that's fine, but you do have to understand that. The function is not defined here. That's what the whole is representing. So for f of two, we might just write dne. f of two does not exist. There isn't a value of the function when x equals two. But this is where limits again come in handy for this situation. Although I can't say that the function equals something at two, it's not accurate to say that I don't understand the behavior of the function near two. If we look at the function near two, it looks exactly how we would expect. We can think about the limit. Okay, so although the function doesn't have a value at x equals two, I might ask, what value is it approaching? as we approach that horizontal position of two. If I imagine the values of the function as I move along it horizontally, what value is it approaching as we approach the horizontal position of two? At two, the function is not defined, but as we approach that horizontal position, it's clear that the function is approaching a value of four. Yes, there's a hole there, but if we're near two on the function, if we're near x equals two, we are near four. The limit of the function as x approaches two, we would say is equal to four. So with this line, and with this hole, we have a simple example of the more complicated phenomena that we saw here. There was a particular point where we couldn't calculate the thing that we wanted to. Just like here, the function is not defined at x equals two. However, in this situation, we said how perhaps we could figure out what the limit of the rate of change is as x gets infinitely close to c. Just like over here, we can say, although I don't know what the function equals it to, in fact, I know that it doesn't equal anything, it has no value there, I do know what the values of the function do as we get infinitely close to x equals two. As we get infinitely close to x equals two, as x approaches two, 
The limit of the function is four. That's what the function is approaching, even though it doesn't take on that value. And that's the key part of this example, is understanding the difference between a function's value and its limit. To perhaps drive this point home further, we could actually give the function a value at x equals two and still have this similar situation. So let's say we just cross out that DNE, let's actually give the function a value at x equals two. Now, if we went ahead and filled in this hole, filled in this empty circle, it would look just like the nice line x plus two that we would expect it to. But we don't have to do that. If I want to assign the function a value at x equals two, it's my right to put that wherever I like. I can do that. So perhaps at x equals two, I'll say that my function, my very special function I'm making just for you, it takes on a value of y equals two. When x equals two, the function equals two. So it's just an ordinary line, a plain old line, right until you get to x equals two, where poof, there's this hole and it jumps down for a second, and then it's right back to being a normal line. It's only at x equals two where it exhibits this strange behavior. Now, again, I ask you, what is the limit of the function now as x approaches two? Take a second and think about it. I'll ask you again, what's the limit of the function as x approaches two? I'm here on my function. I'm letting the horizontal position approach to what is the limit of the value of the function. Hopefully you got it right, it's four. I've not changed anything about the behavior of the function near to, it's only at to where I've just changed the behavior of the function. It's still the case that horizontally, as we approach that position of two, the function's value is still approaching four. Now, it just so happens that I can say that f of two actually does have some value. f of two is in fact equal to two, but the limit of the function as x approaches two is four. Is the function behaving strangely? Yes. Is there anything wrong with this? Not necessarily, not really. I mean, in certain contexts, this is a big issue. However, there's nothing wrong with it, mathematically speaking. Part of what is going to make calculus hard is that for any of these terms to have any meaning or any use at all, you're going to have to see some functions that are maybe a little more gross and less friendly than you're used to. And again, here the takeaway should be that the limit of a function at a point can be different from the function's actual value at that point. The function could be completely undefined at the point in question, or it could have a value that is not what you would expect from the limit. As a final note, let's come back to this equation, because when I wrote it, I said, let's just ignore the whole as we write this equation. This equation is not actually correct for describing the function I've graphed here. And you're probably pretty comfortable at this point with describing functions as equations. So you might ask, what equation could possibly give me something goofy like this, a function with a hole in it? Well, let's imagine we're trying to write an equation for the function that we drew originally. So the one that didn't have a value at x equals two, the one that was just completely undefined at x equals two. Although it's not true that the function just equals x plus two, that doesn't completely capture its behavior, that is a pretty good start. I can write that f of x equals x plus two. And now let's think about this. You would probably agree with me. I'll write this uh, over here. We'll squeeze some more math in. You'd probably agree with me that if I have x plus two, I could multiply this by, let's say one, and it wouldn't change anything, right? Of course. I could also multiply x plus two by, let's say two over two. It wouldn't change anything since two over two is just one. So of course I can multiply by two over two. So then you might say, well, perhaps also I can multiply by x plus two, or sorry, I can multiply x plus two by x over x because no matter what x is, the x's here are just gonna cancel. I've just multiplied by one, so I haven't changed anything. That's true with one giant exception. In the case where x equals zero in this situation, well, in that case, this thing is not gonna cancel out because when x equals zero, this is zero divided by zero, which is a problem. Those don't cancel out. Zero divided by zero is not one, it's undefined. So by multiplying by x over x, yeah, for the most part, I haven't changed anything. The x's just cancel out to one, except when x is equal to zero. When x equals zero, all of a sudden we've introduced a hole because this expression is not going to be defined at x equals zero. 
That's how we can pretty much not change something except for introducing one hole. Now in our case, the hole was not at x equals zero, it was at x equals two. So the equation for that original function is x plus two, which describes the line for the most part, except we need to introduce that hole at x equals two. And to do that, all we have to do is multiply by x minus two divided by x minus two. Now for any value of x, x minus two divided by x minus two, those will cancel out to one. And I'm just gonna get this line like I would expect, except when we plug in x equals two, there's gonna be a problem because this is gonna be zero and this is gonna be zero. Zero divided by zero is not one. They will not cancel out. There's going to be a hole. This expression will not be defined when x equals two. And that's how we get a line that looks exactly how we would expect, except at a single point, there's a hole. Now, what about after making the change and saying that f of two is equal to two? Well, now this doesn't work anymore. There can't just be a hole because the function actually does have a value at x equals two. Well, this is where those piecewise functions you hopefully studied in pre-calculus come in handy. With piecewise functions, we can describe this new function that has a value at x equals two. We can describe it no problem. I just write that f of x is equal to, and then I'm going to write x plus two because that's the behavior of the function a lot of the time, specifically, when is this the behavior of the function? It's the behavior when x is not equal to two. As long as x isn't equal to two, the line is just behaving exactly how you would expect. It's only at x equals two, where the function behaves a little weirdly and suddenly takes on a value of two. Again, that's at x equals two. And so this would be a piecewise way to describe this function after assigning it a value at x equals two. Anyways, I've given you quite a bit more here than I really, really want you to take away. What I really, really want you to take away is that one, this silly example of a line with a hole in it is not supposed to be you know, confusing and bizarre to frustrate you. It's supposed to be the simplest example of something that is bizarre and confusing. It's meant to help you understand that. And the that is that a function can have behavior at a point which is different from its behavior near the point. The value of a function at a point can be different from its limit at that point. The limit of this function as x approaches two is four, but the function's value at x equals two is two. And this idea of distinguishing what happens at a point from what happens as we get arbitrarily close to that point, this is the key concept that's going to allow you to thoughtfully tackle the infinities and paradoxes of calculus. I'll leave it there. Good luck. Be sure to check out my Calculus One course and Calculus One exercises playlist in the description. Got over 200 exercises in that calculus playlist and they're sorted to follow your typical sequence of topics. So be sure to check those out. Let me know if you have any questions and subscribe for more of the swankiest math videos on the internet.